Good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth, the Education Coordinator for Marlene's Market in Delhi. Tonight's special guest that we have with us, and it's always an honor, we have Neil Edward Levin, and he is the Senior Nutrition Educator Education Manager for Now Foods, and he has a plethora of credentials and wonderful information to share with us tonight on nutrition for men's health. Thank you so much, Neil, for joining us. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm glad to talk to you and anyone uh, who is working with or shopping at Marlene's. Uh, Marlene's are very good friends of ours, so we're always happy to share information. And hi, Pete. Hi, Dave. Uh, anyone else who's watching and listening? So we're going to be talking about nutrition for men, supplementing a balanced diet. And these are some of my credentials, just so you know, I'm not just making stuff up. I guess you probably figured that out. So first, let's look at some of the uh, dietary deficits that are uh, potentially occurring in men, uh, diet and health expert opinions. Uh, first of all, Abbott Nutrition has uh, nutrition news, and one of the things they suggest for men is to pump up protein. Dietary protein is the most important factor, preventing and reversing. Two fish-based meals a week is, are recommended by the American Heart Association. Uh, Deep-colored flesh like salmon, mackerel, tuna, sardines, bluefish are recommended. Uh, the color of the flesh indicates the level of nutrients in there, uh, omega-3 and even pigments. Uh, for example, salmon has astaxanthin, a very healthy carotenoid, which uh, is responsible for the color of the salmon. It's also the color of other things uh, that you would get from the sea. Uh, flamingo color is, is that color as well from eating uh, algae or, or fish that consume as. Uh, uh, algae that produces astaxanthin. Uh, they also suggest easing up on refined carbohydrates, going more for whole grains and not the refined ones, because uh, that helps manage weight and cognitive health. Insulin resistance can raise the blood sugar, and having a lot of refined carbohydrates tends to challenge the blood sugar control mechanism, which uses insulin and results over time in insulin resistance where insulin becomes less and less effective at moving sugar out of the bloodstream and into the cells where it belongs in order to produce energy. Uh, there's also some structural benefits from sugar, which is another topic. Uh, glucosamine would be a good example of that. So reduce intake of refined carbohydrates from processed uh, foods and sugary beverages. Try to get whole grain, uh, whole foods, eating a fruit instead of fruit juice, vegetables, whole grains instead of refined grains, whole wheat bread, quinoa are a couple of examples. Of course, not everyone is going to want to do wheat because of gluten issues but or, or wheat allergies. But uh, you know there are other options that are whole grains. Uh, they also recommend checking vitamin D levels. Uh, People who don't spend much time outside, uh, vitamin D foods are typically fortified foods or animal products. Vitamin D helps with both bone and muscle health, keep you strong. Uh, vitamin D, of course, also helps with immunity and has other benefits. Uh, one thing to remember is, uh, you know, you're in Seattle. Uh, at this latitude, you cannot make vitamin D between late September and late March. So you go out in the sun, sunlight, say Christmas day, day uh, stark naked, sit out there at noon, sunbathe, no vitamin D, the sun's too low in the sky. It's filtered too much for the UVB rays to reach the skin and penetrate the skin. Uh, a rule of thumb, by the way, is if you're outside in the sun, the sun has to be at least halfway up in the sky or higher, which means your shadow has to be shorter than how tall you are in order for you to make vitamin D from sunlight. And there are so few 
few foods containing vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D is mostly in whole fish where it's in the livers. Uh, it's in fortified dairy products, things like that. Uh, so you have to be able to get the vitamin D from these sources. Egg yolks is another source, but again, the chickens have to be free range and out in the sun in order to make their own vitamin D. So, you know, the caged chickens are not going to do that. By the way, I was in Brazil in April and they call free range eggs uh, enlightened eggs on, on my translator. <laughs> I like that. Kind of a cool way to describe it. Uh, but again, up to over 40% of Americans are deficient in vitamin D. Uh, it's probably higher in the elderly because they don't eat as regularly typically, especially if they're, uh, say, a, a widow or widower or someone who doesn't have someone cooking for them. If they're not eating wholesome diets, a lot of institutional food is not that great in that regard. And a lot of them don't go out in the sun that much, especially at the right angles of the sun. So having vitamin D levels tested, and for most people, taking 400 to 600 units of vitamin D is recommended for just about everybody. People with darker pigment skins would need more vitamin D. And when we're looking at whole grains, uh, which we mentioned a couple minutes ago, only 8% of us eat three servings of whole grains daily. We're typically getting one third of that. And in, in the U.S., children get less than one serving per day. And uh, we were just talking uh, in Washington, D.C. yesterday about uh, some of these issues where in, in some areas, the fast food restaurants are propped up by the high schools or colleges where the students are coming there to eat. And when if they close the campus, some of these restaurants are closing, these fast food restaurants. They're, you know, kids are, are enjoying the fast foods and not enjoying wholesome foods. Whole grains also make you feel full. Half your grains at least should be whole grains. If you're sick, they should be at least 80% of your diet, by the way, uh, in terms of the grains you're eating. They make you feel full. They have key nutrients, antioxidants, fiber, uh, polyphenols, uh, healthy fats like vitamin E and uh, plant sterols. So oatmeal, brown rice, whole grain breads are preferred. That's from the USDA. There's also B vitamins in whole grains. They, they're not in the refined grains. They have to be added back. There are minerals in the whole grains, uh, amino acids. Uh, phytates and phytoestrogens, which are healthy protective compounds. And when we're looking at nutritional deficiencies in the population, we see the percent of people with deficiencies are, you know, typically between 1% and 10% for single ones. But again, when you're looking at multiple deficiencies, that actually adds up to a lot more. And as we mentioned before, over 40% have vitamin D deficiency. And one issue is that the fruits, vegetables, uh, wheat, grains uh, are declining the nutrition. Uh, it's called the dilution effect. Foods today contain less nutrition than foods in our grandparents' generation. And 6% less protein in the diet, eating the same foods, by the way. 20% less vitamin C, 38% less vitamin B2. Trace minerals fell by some 70% uh, uh, in both the U.S. and England when we're looking at historical value of foods. Uh, I mean, if you're giving three minerals as a fertilizer, NPK, and you're not giving the other 70 odd minerals. The plants gonna, aren't gonna be as healthy and they're not gonna be able to convey those minerals to us. I was just uh, doing trainings in North Macedonia in the Balkans. One of the issues there is that the soil in that area is very low in the 
essential mineral selenium. And that affects immunity, antioxidants, et cetera. Also, the iron content in meats is declining. And that's because a lot of the meat is not grazing animals. They're getting the iron from the grasses. If they're eating corn or soybeans, they're not getting the iron. So that also drops the iron content of milk by over 60%. Uh, we're seeing magnesium levels dropping in meat and milk, copper levels dramatically falling, dairy foods, 90% loss of copper over the last 50, 60 years, and even Parmesan cheese, 70% loss of calcium. The minerals are not getting in the foods if the animals aren't grazing. So Men's Health Magazine also says that a uh, there are special diets that lead to nutrient deficiencies. This is something all the professional nutritionists know. For example, a vegan diet, B12, zinc, iron, iodine, omega-3, protein. I can add uh, copper and other nutrients uh, to this as well as things that would be missing. Uh, you need these for many things in the body, nerve, muscle, thyroid, blood cells, etc. A paleo diet. It could be missing many other things. Uh, this would include vitamin B2, calcium, vitamin D. We need this for many things in, in the body as well. A gluten-free diet. Where are you getting your fiber? Where are you getting your B vitamins like folate? You need these for many uh, different body uh, structures and operations cardiovascular health, blood sugar control, et cetera, et cetera. A low carb diet, similar things, fiber, vitamins, antioxidants, carotenoids, phytochemicals. So Men's Health Magazine also suggests the five nutrients people are not getting enough of, men are not getting enough of. <laughs> They're also mentioning vitamin D. <clears throat> the, Levels should be at least 30 nanograms per milliliter, better if they're 40 or 50, by the way. And take at least 1,400 units daily if results are lower. And actually, it's hard to boost levels at that. If you're really low, you need to be up above 10,000 units for your intake for being able to absorb and boost the levels. <clears throat> Again, these are the foods that contain vitamin D. Uh, some mushrooms contain vitamin D as well, vitamin D2, which is actually a, a good source. But the mushrooms have to be exposed to sun rays because they're going to produce them from plant sterols, from sunlight, just like we will produce them, the vitamin D, from animal sterols, cholesterol, in our own skin. And vitamin D levels help stabilize PSA levels which uh, again helps with prostate health. So, you know, men want to have good prostate health. One of the ways to do that is to have uh, vitamin D is one of the things needed. There are vitamin D receptors in the prostate. And you can get vitamin D from the diet or by synthesizing it, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the UVB rays are the key rays that convert the cholesterol into the precursors of vitamin D in the body. So again, the farther north you are in the Northern Hemisphere, the less sunlight you're gonna get, the shallower angle where the atmosphere is filtering out more of it, darker skin pigmentation, you need far more sunlight to penetrate darker skin, including tanned skin, by the way. Uh, winter, the seasons, uh, Avoidance of the sun, sunscreen. <clears throat> so here's your sunshine calculator. And when you're looking at where we are, you could see between November and February, no vitamin D can be produced. Here's your angle of the sun, your sun chart. That's, that, that's a good one to remember. And this talks about the key you need uh, if it's these darker red. Uh, which is only in the summer. You need sufficient vitamin D for your light skin, 10 minutes, 
dark skin 45 minutes. Uh, when you're talking about these other five months surrounding summer, uh, spring and fall, it's going to take uh, far more time, at least double, to make vitamin D. So, you know, th this, these are the criteria for actually producing vitamin D from sunlight. And again, wild caught salmon has far more vitamin D than farm raised salmon. The nutrition is just different in them. And part of it's because salmon are eating other fish and getting the fish livers that already contain vitamin D and concentrating them in their own liver, livers. And vitamin D is important to help with calcium and phosphorus status, bone mineralization, but also cell growth, cell differentiation and immune function. So there are a lot of other benefits from vitamin D. 800 to 1,000 really is the minimum recommended by the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Supplementation, if people are not getting sunlight or have dark-skinned uh, individuals institutionalized, at least 800 units a day. It's really safe to take up to 10,000 units a day for the general population. And there are other issues, obesity, fat malabsorption, that enhance vitamin D breakdown and require higher levels of vitamin D intake or production. <clears throat> the two forms of vitamin D, vitamin D2 and D3 are equal in their ability to cure rickets, which is the vitamin D deficiency disease. And most steps involved in metabolism and activation of vitamin D2 and D3 are identical. They both raise serum 25-OH D levels. At nutritional doses, they work the same. At high doses, vitamin D2 is less effective. This is according to the National Institutes of Health. And uh, the reason for this is vitamin D2 is metabolized more quickly than vitamin D3. Uh, so if you wanna give, say the medical model, you wanna give you know, 50,000, 100,000 units of vitamin D with an injection, it's going to last longer between doctor visits. If you give D2, it disappears faster, but according to researchers at Cornell University, that means vitamin D2 is 10 times less toxic, less likely to cause overdose than vitamin D3. All the, but at normal nutritional le levels, the thousand units or the, you know, those kind of levels that we would take supplementally, there is no real difference in the body between D2 and D3, although D2 is uh, the one we'll get from plant foods and D3 is the one we produce in our body or get from fish. So the difference was lost with daily supplementation at normal dosing. It was only the bolus dose, the huge dose, that there was a significant difference on the two forms. Another nutrient we're not getting enough of, according to Men's Health Magazine, is magnesium. You need it for cardiovascular health. Men only get about 80% of the RDA. Uh, this was in 2015. The RDA has since been raised to 420 milligrams. So they're getting even a lower percentage. Few men will reach the RDA without supplementation. And one, one way to get some of these together is the ZMA formula which contains zinc and magnesium with vitamin B6. So th this is one option to get uh, some of these together. And for male athletes who were supplementing with ZMA during eight weeks of intensive training, they had increased levels of muscle building hormones, increased leg strength, uh, higher levels of free testosterone, total testosterone, IGF-1. Men with placebo had lower levels of these hormones that affect strength, uh, muscle retention, et cetera. And here's some of the studies done on that. <clears throat> Another nutrient that men are not getting enough of is vitamin B12. One way it works is for brain health, but that's only the methyl form of B12. The uh, normal forms of B12, the uh, cyanocobalamin or adenosylcobalamin, the dibenkazides, another name for that, 
is for energy. <clears throat> so they're concerned about the, the form that helps with brain health, but there's actually multiple forms of B12 in the body. One form works on energy, one works on brain and nerves and detox. <clears throat> so either way, medications will block vitamin B12, including very common ones like antacids and metformin. And that's a reason why you would take supplemental B12. Now, when you take B12 supplementally, it will absorb at about 1% of the oral dose, which means if you took 100 micrograms, you'll only absorb about one microgram. If you take 1,000, you're only going to absorb about 10. If you take 10,000, you'll only, only absorb about 100. So with that in mind, that's why there are huge percentages of the daily value on labels, where it might be hundreds or thousands of times the daily value, which is related to the RDA. And that's because the absorption is simply not there. You're only getting a fraction of that percentage it absorbed in the body. But that's okay because it's non-toxic. You're not going to overdose on it. And vitamin B12 is mostly in animal foods. It cannot be synthesized in, in the human body. And it's one of the ones I mentioned that vegetarians and vegans will have a hard time getting enough of. In fact, I've been a vegetarian for 50 and a half years now. And one of the first things I took was a multivitamin to get the B12 to make sure I'm getting what I need. Now, B12 deficiency is found in 15 to 20% of the population, uh, heavier in the elderly. So vegetarians, uh, pregnancy, People with thyroid issues, anemia, blood loss, uh, malignancy, cancers, uh, liver or kidney disease. They can deplete their B12s and it could take months or years for symptoms to show because the body tends to store it and uh, values it to that degree. That's one of the reasons it's non toxic, the body can store a lot of it. So you can absorb about three micrograms orally uh, through active transport. Now, if you have gastric bypass or things like that, <laughs> you might be able to not absorb that through active transport. But the passive diffusion through the entire intestine is still about 1%. And that's what, what I was talking about earlier. We'll absorb regardless of intrinsic factor, which is what, the active transport. And clinical trials, for example, here's the Cochrane database, a very uh, prestigious uh, reference here. Uh, taking at least 1,000 micrograms is as effective as intramuscular injections. But, but as I mentioned earlier, there's two forms recorded by the body, not one. A lot of companies have gone to just giving you methylcobalamin which is not the only form in the body, and it doesn't do all the things you want vitamin B12 to do in the body. So you can see B12 is cobalamin. Methylcobalamin helps with homocysteine reduction into methionine, detoxification in other words. But the adenosylcobalamin helps with producing energy in the body. Methylcobalamin is not an energetic form. Adenosylcobalamin is. If you take cyanocobalamin, the precursor of both, you get both benefits. It is non-toxic. So about two-thirds of the B12 in the body is in the non-methylated active form, which has its own enzyme system. And about one-third is for nerve stability and detoxification is the methyl form. And there's separate enzyme systems. They, they don't convert into each other. You need both forms. And there's different enzymes. Uh, if you are deficient in the methyl form, you accumulate excess homocysteine, a risk factor for inflammation, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. And the other form, producing energy and making hemoglobin, the blood cell. B12 also has a role in bone health. 
And homocysteine levels can interfere with collagen, making bones more fragile and blood vessels more fragile. Another nutrient men don't get enough of is potassium. Young men only get about two thirds of the recommendation. They load up on sodium, making it worse. And of course, produce is the main source. Another nutrient that men are not getting enough of is iodine. And we see this even in areas where uh, around the Midwest, this, the soil doesn't contain much iodine. And that's a reason why people would use iodized salt, but they don't use iodized salt in processed foods. So you're getting the sodium without the iodine. The iodized salt is often not fortified as much as the FDA recommends. And again, if people are on low sodium diets, they might be avoiding salt. We've even seen goiters, which is a, uh, one of the symptoms of iodine deficiency, uh, you know, thyroid goiters, goiters um, in Boston and areas where there's plenty of seafood available. So, you know, this is something men can get iodine from supplements. They can get it from iodized salt. They can get it from certain foods, uh, dairy foods, uh, eggs, and seafoods tend to be good sources. Again, vegans, not going to get a lot of it. And iodine and the amino acid th tyrosine are needed to produce the thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. This is the steps, uh, how they're produced. But uh, you know, the important thing to remember is that uh, iodine and tyrosine, these, these two nutrients are the main contributors to producing thyroid hormones. So let's look at some of these other ingredients and uh, see what's there. Um, we can look at tribulus. Tribulus is an herb. Uh, it has two fractions, protodiacin and protogracilin, uh, which are saponin fractions. You'll often see them standardized to either saponins or protodiacin, would be the two ways they'd be on labels. And they work by helping convert testosterone into dehydrotestosterone. It increases sex drive, but it also contributes to blood circulation and oxygen transport. <clears throat> now, there are different tribulus formulas. As you see, this one is standardized to 45% saponins, of which protodiacin would be one of the major ones helping with endocrine function and male reproductive health. Here's another one that's a stronger one, a thousand milligram in a tablet. Uh, again, it's uh, the same kind of standardization. Or Tribulus Extreme, this one is actually standardized to the fraction of saponin protodiacin. And it's got some other interesting ingredients. It's a formula. The organic raw maca root from uh, South America, the epimedium or horny goat weed, the green tea extract, which has uh, very powerful polyphenols, damiana leaf and ashwagandha extract. And uh, some of these will work by being adaptogens, by helping the body adapt to stress. And of course, stress affects hormones and uh, mood and many other things. And uh, the maca itself, uh, taking this form, the six to one concentrate is gelatinized, which means the starch is removed and the protein is concentrated. It does not mean gelatin was used in the processing. It's actually a vegan friendly product. It's an all plant-based material. But there is some evidence that taking that material increases semen volume, sperm count, sperm motility in healthy males. And it also shows that it helps uh, fe subjective feelings of sexual desire in healthy men as well. So this is an organic maca. Uh, we sell it in both a powder form. It's, it's certified organic, by the way. And we also sell it in a capsule form. 
And this one has very specific types of maca in there. It's like 80% black maca roots, and there's purple maca roots and yellow maca roots. So it, it's using very specific ratios in there. The standard maca we sell, which is the uh, maca root itself, not the concentrate. Uh, I don't have a picture of it here. Is it's not concentrated. It is not organic. It's not a specific types of maca like this one is. And then the Asian and American ginsengs, the Panax ginseng and Panax kinkafolius, are the major sources of ginseng. It's used for mental and physical vitality, fatigue and stress, adrenal and muscle function. <laughs> There's also Siberian ginseng, which is no longer called that because it's not a true ginseng. It's not a Panax plant. It's Eleuthero. But uh, there are plants, you know, Suma is called Brazilian ginseng and Ashwagandha is called Ayurvedic ginseng. Those are nicknames. Those are not actual botanical names. So again, it helps against uh, with the effects of physical and mental stress. Saw palmetto tends to treat symptoms associated with benign prostate uh, hypertrophy. Uh, it may reduce prostate enlargement in some people. Uh, it's not a drug. It's not going to have a very strong, fast effect. Uh, someone who has these issues obviously should be under doctor's care, but this is an option they would have. Uh, it's approved uh, in Germany and France for uh, prostate health claims. Uh, what we claim here is supports healthy prostate function. And uh, this is actually a product I take. 320 milligram, which is the clinical dose in a base of pumpkin seed oil. And it's in a veggie soft gel, which means it's a vegan friendly form of taking this. And I did work on formulating the nutritional profiles in the Atom formulas, which are our men's formulas. This is a one a day formula, vegetarian, vegan friendly, kosher, halal. And we've combined uh, the multivitamins and minerals with saw palmetto, lycopene, alpha lipoic acid, CoQ10, resveratrol, and grapeseed extract. Here is the formula for that. And you can see we're also combining the regular and the coenzyme forms of some of the B vitamins. So it's not just B6 pyridoxine, but also pyridoxal 5-phosphate in there, a blend. And you could see the nutrients besides the vitamins and minerals in this section here on the right. <clears throat> Saw palmetto, alpha lipoic acid, organic alpha, aloe vera, which actually on tablets makes it far more tolerable in the stomach than tablets like multivitamins without aloe. We've done studies on this and actually found that uh, our complaints about upset stomach from taking a multivitamin dropped dramatically when we started adding a little bit of organic aloe vera concentrate to these pills. So a little uh, secret I'm sharing with you here. And you can see uh, we also have the lycopene, which is also used for prostate health in far higher levels that you would find typically in multivitamins. They would typically be at a lower level like the lutein. And by the way, vitamin K2 is now listed separately from K1 on labels uh, mandated by the FDA. So when you're looking at the K1, that is not the total of vitamin K in a formula because they have decided K2 is not essential, but K1 is. So they're separated. There's no daily value for a K2. Those are going to be listed separately on labels. Something new. We also make a capsule version, which is three tablets daily and has, uh, you know, you're getting a little stronger dosing on that. Here's the formula there. You know, so you could see like the saw palmetto is double versus what the, uh, the tablet is, that kind of thing. So you're getting some stronger levels, typically double by taking three capsules versus one tablet.
And we make the soft gel, which I can't take it as a vegetarian, but it's actually the best formula that, that I helped design of the three. And the reason why is because we can use the fat-soluble nutrients in their original form without having to dry them out, spraying them on a starch, which is the way they normally do it. So now we can have a lot more saw palmetto in there because we don't have to dry it out and put it on some other substance. So this is actually the best of the three formulas, in my opinion. Uh, although it's not vegetarian, it, it is because of the bovine gelatin soft gel. But again, we could do a, a base of pumpkin seed oil. Yeah, you know, we could, we could do a lot more with uh, soft gels because the fat soluble things are more concentrated, without having to dry them out. And it's only two a day. And we have another formula that uh, is the active men's sports multi. And it's using a bunch of trademarked ingredients, as you see here, including that ZMA that I mentioned earlier. This is the formula for that one. And by the way, if Marlene's doesn't have the formulas in stock, you can always ask them to special order them for you or ask for a substitute. Uh, maybe there's a different form. Uh, they might not have every one of the formulas in stock at, at, at all the stores. But uh, you can see this one, especially when you're looking at the extra ingredients. MCT oil, you could put, that's the base on this one instead of the pumpkin seed oil. And MCT oil actually is interesting. It's, it's from uh, uh, palm oil, but it helps absorb fats. It is a great fat absorber, second only to alcohol in terms of helping fat absorption. There's a blend of amino acids, including the branch chain amino acids. There's tribulus in here. There's ZMA in here. There's the plant sterols, the Panax ginseng, a decent amount, maca root, the green tea, saw palmetto, not as strong on the saw palmetto as some of the other formulas. Some of these antioxidants, the K1 and K2. So, you know, you can see it's a nice formula. with more of these uh, things to enhance athletic and sports and those kind of things. And I've actually compared all three of all four of these formulas for you if you want to see them, but I'm not going to linger on this slide just so you could see that they all have similar things in terms of these are all the vitamins. And you can see the one a day tablets are lower than the two a day soft gels if you just look at the B vitamins or the three-a-day uh, dry capsules. And again, it's stronger on the sports formula, just to give you just a sense of the differences. And looking at the minerals, you can also see some differences. A one-a-day is not gonna give nearly as much as some of these nutrients as a two or three-a-day formula, obviously. And when you're looking at the extra ingredients, there's a lot more extra ingredients in the sports multi. All the stuff down here at the bottom is in addition to these common ones that are in these other formulas. So the Adam have some similar things in there. Uh, we can't put the plant sterols or the pumpkin seed oil in the uh, in the other formulas like we can in the soft gels, though. And you can see even the lycopene, decent amount. Uh, it's probably you know six times or eight times as much as in a normal multi in our atom one a day, but it's even double that in the soft gels. You know this is equivalent to what what you might buy in a separate soft gel. And when you're looking at the prostate. It's part of the male reproductive system. It produces fluid for semen for, to transport serum. And it's about the, normally about the size of a chestnut. And the urethra that carries the urine from the bladder out of the body actually has to pass through it. So if it's enlarged, it pinches it off, makes it hard to void the bladder, <clears throat> makes it hard to uh, avoid frequent urination. So this is a little more detail, but uh, 
I'm not going to go into great detail here, but just, just so you know that the urine has to pass through this gland. And if it's swollen, it could, it could reduce the ability to get rid of the urine properly. Now, this is another formula that I uh, developed the uh, basics on, which is the clinical straight prostate health formula. It's a soft gel in gelatin capsules. We have an original prostate support, but we have a clinical strength prostate support. It has saw palmetto extract, the red pigment lycopene that you're familiar with from tomatoes and watermelon, and beta cetosterol, which actually has claims, uh, FDA approved claims for helping with uh, cholesterol management, but it also helps with prostate. So we're using levels, clinical levels of those three nutrients uh, which, which provides plant sterols, but also we have turmeric, quercetin, free radical scavenging herbs. Three a day is our recommendation. Here's the formula. Uh, we were the first ones to add vitamin D to the prostate formula. As I mentioned earlier, vitamin D is something that is has a role in prostate health. There are vitamin D receptors in the prostate. Uh, so I don't think anyone before us ever used vitamin D when I designed this formula. We've got, of course, the zinc and the selenium, which are cofactors for this. They're also cofactors for producing a lot of hormones and things in the body, including thyroid hormones. Here's your full clinical dose of saw palmetto extract, your full clinical dose of plant sterols, the beta cetosterol phytosterols. Uh, it's the clinical dose for both cholesterol, cardiovascular health, and for prostate health. Uh, We've got the stinging nettle root extract. The, the leaf is used for allergies and uh, respiratory. The root is used for the prostate. So uh, watch when you're looking at nettle root on a label, which form is used there. We have the quercetin in there, which is a, a free radical fighter, what uh, would typically be called an antioxidant uh, on labels. The FDA only allows vitamins and minerals to make antioxidant claims, however. We've got the 95% curcuminoid turmeric extract. We've got a gram of pumpkin seed oil, 10 milligrams of lycopene. You were seeing one and a half to three on the men's formula. This is the clinical strength. A lot of green tea extract standardized to 50% EGCG. A lot of the ex green tea extracts are far lower in this active. Pomegranate extract, a decent amount, the trans resveratrol, the natural form of resveratrol, and a flaxseed extract, which uh, it has some interesting roles in men's health as well. Uh, you know, flax is actually a very healthy fat for men and fiber. The flax seeds have the lignans, which are part of the fiber, the flax oil does not. So when we're looking at the prostate support formulas, we're standardizing to minimum 85% fatty acids with these phytosterols. Uh, 85 to 95% would be the typical range. We claim the lower end of the range. A lot of companies will claim the middle or the high end of the range, but they're all similar. On the liquids, they, they're typically this strength. On the powders, they're half this strength or less because they have to dry it out by spraying it on a starch. And according to this study, the effects of saw palmetto extract and the lower urinary tract, the combination of the fatty acids and phytosterols in saw palmetto help maintain healthy hormone levels, including the low oxidized uh, testosterone, a healthy inflammatory response, and a relaxing effect on the lower urinary tract of males in the prostate. So helping to keep the prostate, uh, allowing the urine to flow through it properly. Lycopene is another free radical scavenger, a carotenoid, associated with lower incidence of benign prostate hyperplasia or swelling. This is a study. It shows daily supplementation with 320 milligrams of soft palmetto extract for two years, 120 patients. 
mild to moderate lower urinary tract symptoms, statistically significant improvements in prostate symptoms score, quality of life, urine flow, uh, erectile function, and reduction in residual urinary volume during that two-year period. And you can see the decrease in residual urinary volume, in other words, the inability to empty the bladder. We also have the standard prostate support formula. It's not as strong and doesn't have as many nutrients in there. It's got three milligrams of lycopene instead of 10. It still has pumpkin seed oil. It still has stinging nettle root extract. It have, has half as much of the saw palmetto. And it has uh, zinc and B6, no selenium. Here's the compar comparison of the two products. I would normally recommend the clinical strength, uh, but for you know just preventive purposes, the regular one might be fine, and the price would certainly be a little bit better. Men's virility power. This includes horny goat weed and other herbs like muripama, maca, and tribulus. It is a vegetarian-friendly formula that's not in a soft gel. It's got your horny goat weed the Murapalma concentrate, the maca root, the tribulus, uh, Panax ginseng, Damiana ginkgo to help with circulation, and cayenne to help with circulation. Then we've got three formulas in the Testojack family. Healthy sexual activity for males. This one has ZMA LJ100, a, a trademark form of long jack or, or long, tongue cat alley, and tribulus. So reproductive function, libido, sexual performance. It's got some B6, which helps with a lot of metabolism in the body, uh, amino acids and other things, uh, metabolism. It has... Uh, the ZMA, which is your zinc and magnesium. We have the tribulus, a pretty good amount. And we've got the LJ100, which is a very concentrated uh, form of the uh, long jack. Uh, kind of a unique patented form. You can see the trademark on there. And... This is a study, a uh, single volunteer, just to test it. Uh, they took two capsules twice a day for four weeks, and there was a 25% increase in total and free plasma testosterone levels, maintaining them in the healthy range, however. It didn't throw them off a of whack. So supplementation in this healthy adult male was effective in supporting testosterone levels and maintaining them within a normal range. We also have Testojack 200. This uses a generic Tonkat alley, tribulus, maca, and horny goatweed. We've added American and Panax ginseng and Murrah Palma. And this one is, is a little different formula. I have a comparison at the end so you can see the three together. This one uses the Tonkat alley, the long jack extract, the organic maca, actually a pretty good amount. Epimedium, the horny goat weed. The tribulus, American ginseng, Panax ginseng, the Asian ginseng, and the Mura Palma together. So this helps with, again, reproductive function, libido, and sexual performance. And lastly, we have the Testo Jack 300. This is the pure long jack. Tonkat Alley as a standalone product. Now, we also did a study with two healthy male volunteers, 57 and 58 years old, supplementing two capsules after breakfast and resulted in support of already normal total and plasma testosterone. So we saw the total plasma testosterone go up over a 28-day period, and we saw the free plasma testosterone go up even more.
So, I mean, we're seeing some pretty good numbers. Uh, total testosterone, 64% increase and 17% above baseline for the two volunteers. And 59% and 62% increase on free testosterone. And here's a comparison of the three formulas. Now I separated out the two forms of Tonkat Alley or Long Jack, uh, this trademark material, which is in this formula, and the generic one, which is in these other formulas. So, you know, people have a choice. Uh, sometimes they're taking one thing or another. Maybe they think they're getting enough zinc. They don't want this form. Uh, we give choices. You can also get the epimedium or horny goat weed as a standalone product, but we've added a little bit of the maca root to it. And again, you could see a, a comparison on this. And we have the IGF-1. This is not something you're going to take if you are a competitive athlete. This is something that's not allowed for competitive athletes. But it is something that's produced in the liver based on pituitary signaling. It has a role in growth uh, of cells and availability of nutrients. So for men's health, this is a product that's used. Again, a uh, competitive athlete is regularly tested. Testing is probably not allowed, even though it is not necessarily harmful. And we've got uh, a couple of, of spray options for that. It, it's very low dose. You're looking at nanogram dosing. So you're, you're getting very, very, very low amounts of these. And it also comes in a lozenge form. Again, you're talking about nanograms. Nanograms are billionths of a gram. So you're, you're taking tiny, tiny amounts of this uh, hormone. And... A lot of men are concerned about soy and think soy is going to be negative for them. Uh, actually, the safety of isoflavones, the soy components is, uh, is actually proven. Beer is actually more estrogenic. Some beverage could be a significant source of estrogens. So if you're worried about estrogens, you might be more worried about beer than soybeans. Just something to think about. So anyway, that concludes this. If anyone has questions, I'm happy to take them. And thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Yeah, that um that blew my mind about um the two different B12s and also how depleted iron has been. From the diet, yes. Yeah, from the diet. That was mind blowing. I always learn so much from your classes. Thanks. I get that a lot. It's because you do a great job. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because I research and uh, try to figure out how these things work and, and the connections between things. I free associate a lot. So if someone tells me something, I think of something else that I've heard of that's related. And then I look it up. So I'm, I'm a researcher, but I also have this curious mind. Exactly. You're like, but why is that happening? And now I must find out. <laughs> yeah, or... That, that does that relate to this other thing I've heard of? It seems Ooh. similar. It seems like there's some similarity there. Yeah, definitely. I um I really like how you brought up um uh the macas and how there there is different roots because some people think maca root, you know, there there's different colors and they and they all do kind of uh they have different um chemical uh, compounds to them. Yeah, I mean, the fact that they're different colors naturally, it means they have different pigments. They have different phytochemicals in them. And one thing is they grow at different altitudes in the Andes Mountains. Oh. And the, the nutrition of the soil is different in, in the different levels. 
That's neato. I had no idea. But people in, in like Peru and those areas, that they actually eat these like potatoes. Really? They'll eat maca root, men and women. I wonder what it tastes like. It's a starchy root vegetable, kind of potato-like. Yum. If if I ever go, I'll I'll yep. be like, hey, dish me up some maca, <laughs> please. <laughs> Yep, considered healthy, healthy vegetable. One of the reasons to gelatinize it is to remove the starch and concentrate the other nutrients. So you can take a lower dose. So you're not having to um, constantly um, raise the raise the amount. You can well, get. Think of if you eat a baked potato versus you take a pill. Yeah. Volume. Would would Ray way rather take a take a maca pill? <laughs> well, you might like a nice baked potato with butter, but you know, not something you're going to have in a bottle and take with you on. You know, we're not in the area where it's grown and fresh. Exactly. Well, folks, feel free to ask any questions while we have our wonderful expert here in the chat box or feel free to unmute yourself. I'm going to check the Facebook Live here. Yeah, just a reminder, you know, any of these products, uh, you know, if Marlene's doesn't have it at your local store, ask for it and they might have something that you're interested in. Yes. So be able to get it. And also, um, just to let everyone know, we have 25% off of um, assorted varieties. Um, I believe most of what you had mentioned tonight is at a deep discount all month long in honor of Men's Health Month. Dun, 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 dun. So stop on in to either Marlene's. And there's a lovely display as well. Hey, Pete. Elizabeth, every, I think everything is... For now, it's twenty five percent off. We have a line drive of twenty five percent off it's going. The on. whole line, the whole mm -hmm. now. Yeah. And so. now I know. Gotcha. <laughs> there you go. It's, <laughs> it's now or never. <laughs> it's the final that's, now down. That's, there you go. <laughs> well, thank you, Pete. Yeah. Excellent job, Neil. Thank you, sir. All right. I learned um, stuff too. Hard to believe. I, I didn't. I learned stuff when I produce these. I don't learn so much when I give them. <laughs> the research is when I learn. Yeah, and um, what I really like too about your presentations is that you you put the sources right at the bottom. Oh yeah, I'm just not making this stuff up. I you know it's National Institute of Health or Nutrition Journal or whatever it is. Or... Yeah. Yeah. Well, PubMed is just a database of studies. It's not the journal or anything. So. Oh, that's right. P PubMed can include uh, human clinical trials, meta-analyses, cell studies, animal studies. I, I try to rely on human clinical trials. Because you're a clinical nutritionist. Yeah, but it's also... I mean, one question I got when I was in China frequently doing trainings a few years ago, how do we know that your products are going to work on our population just because they work on your population? And I have to tell them, well, it, it's it's first shown the mechanism in cell studies, then it's shown in animal models, then it's shown in human clinical trials in areas with varied varied populations you know the united states has you now not one big ethnic group but a lot of different ethnic groups so if it's working in all three of those models then it's pretty clear it's going to work that's the biology of it you know that if it works in animals and humans then it's going to work in all humans because humans are more similar to each other than humans and and, and mice or what you know whatever the studies are because we're um we're all made up of the same cells yep 
Well, it's the biochemistry too, you know. Oh yes. Uh, I mean, there are some differences. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, yeah, there are some differences. For example, uh, guinea pigs can't make vitamin C. I so did not if you know that. so if you want to do a study comparing what vitamin C does in a mammal, you have to use guinea pigs and not mice because they can make their own vitamin C. Oh my gosh. So you have to know the relative biology of the species you're using in order to see if it's a good model or not, which animals are good models for human digestion. You're not going to use a ruminant animal because they have different digestion, multiple stomachs and chewing their cud and you know, all that kind of stuff. Like cows. Right. That's why we have to get enzymes from uh, like pancreatic enzymes from pigs and not from cows because cows don't have the same digestion. I didn't know that. Yeah. So the people designing studies are supposed to know this stuff and present the background in their study and then you know, figure out the right way to test it where it's going to be an, a good model for humans. Like uh, <clears throat> most animals that make their own vitamin C don't get heart disease. Their arteries don't get plaque. Hmm. So how do you test the model? I, I, I don't condone this, but it's what, what how they did it years ago. They damaged the the livers of the animals so they could not make their own vitamin C. And then they saw what happened when they deprived them of vitamin C in the diet and they started getting plaque. So the animal model of plaque kind of proved what happens in humans, that lack of antioxidants erodes the collagen in the blood vessels and then the, the plaque is used to patch them. And then uh eventually calcium starts depositing on the plaque too and the arteries get narrower and stiffer and the blood pressure goes up they they did all this in an animal model they artificially created that scenario just by depriving them of vitamin c that is yeah that's um although that's cruel that they you know damaged the their livers but it it got us what we know today and that's that's important right like you saw you know now does human studies we don't do animal studies exactly. but virtually every ingredient we sell has had to have animal studies to be allowed on the market before we ever had a hand in it wow and there's new research almost every day yeah. too very cool so we're, we're kind of forced to use ingredients that have this history of safety and efficacy based on studies that might have been done generations ago science is always evolving yep well nowadays they have better models like uh i know they're developing plants now that they can do the genetic research they can analyze plants and predict what they're going to do if you crossbreed them. So they don't have to use GMOs anymore. <clears throat> they they say it's actually faster to do the traditional breeding than producing new GMOs. Now that doesn't mean they're not making GMOs. They're making plenty of GMOs, but there are other researchers who are finding ways around that to get similar now, you can't get all the same effects. You're not going to stop an apple from turning brown by putting a salmon gene in there or something <laughs> with crossbreeding. But if you want to breed you know, similar plants together and get certain characteristics, that, you know, whether it's resistance or needing less uh, water or nutrients or having more nutrients, they can more, more accurately predict that with computers now and getting genetic testing that ra rather than doing traditional crossbreeding for decades 
well, which is how they used to do it. So cr traditional crossbreeding is just about as efficient as GMOs, genetically engineering, but you can't, you don't have the same range of adding artificial capabilities to the plants. That is so fascinating. I I love that there's, it's the, the old traditional way is the best way. <laughs> Well, yeah, because you're not, I mean, one thing that happens when you start doing these crossbreeding is you introduce new allergens and nobody's testing for the allergens on the GMOs. They found this in experiments uh, before where they crossbreed a pea and a bean and to produce some legume and it has allergens that are not in the original two plants. That's it was, It's not predictable. Wow. So, you know, crossbreeding sometimes comes up with unpredictable results. And, you know, that's not necessarily a good thing. It, it's widely believed that the ancient grains, like the ancient wheats, are far less allergenic and people are not reacting to them. People go to Europe and they eat pasta. They're gluten intolerant here, but they eat the, the same gluten supposedly in Italy and that's not have the same reaction. Because they're using non-hybridized grains. I found that the same results when I went to Europe. Yeah. I have real problems with gluten here. And when I was over there and I ate all kinds of gluten, not a single issue. Because they're using different grains. Right. Exactly. They're wheat, but they're yeah. different grains that have not been hybridized. They're traditional varieties. Mm -hmm. Hybridization changes the, the uh, proteins and the allergenicity of the of the grain and now with gmos they're multiplying that even worse and yeah, nobody's I... testing this on the gmos it's not required oh no it should be that's terrible shouldn't it yes it was a political decision in the end of the first bush administration that GMOs were equivalent to regular plants and did not require safety testing. Horrible decision. And nobody's tracking this now. And they're saying there's no evidence that these things are harmful. Well, of course not if you don't study it. Right. And I would I would love to see the increase, like like a study done of since that has been done how many people have increased with gluten sensitivities or intolerances well actually yeah i have a, a gmo presentation I, i've given at the trade show in seattle before the i have a chart on there that's the government government chart uh, it shows the increase in celiac disease at that is uh diagnosed by hospitals. So, you know, official statistics on celiac disease rates. And it's like a, 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 a vertical line almost going up since the introduction of GMO crops. And if you take the uh, use of glyphosate on these GMO crops and on other crops is almost the same curve. How much of it is the GMO and how much is the pesticide? Who knows? Right. And it could be like a double-edged sword in that way, too. Yeah. Because glyphosate works by robbing the plants of minerals and starving the plants. Well, when the glyphosate residues on the foods, it's doing the same thing in our bodies. It's robbing our minerals. It's locking up the minerals. That's how it's patented. That's how it works. I can't what? believe they allow this to, to be legal. Yeah, it's it's not um um what's the word I'm looking for? Ethical. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> not safe, not ethical, but they, they don't require the studies. They're not considering that humans consuming it are going to have the same negative effect as the plants that are exposed to it that aren't genetically engineered to resist the glyphosate.
Well, it would be great for you to maybe do um, a, a GMO talk with us sometime. I would be honored to speak to you and your uh, customers and audience about that. Yay. We'll, well talk offline. Oh, yes, definitely. Well, let's say goodbye to our Facebook Live friends. Thanks so much for tuning in. And um, definitely catch Neil on another presentation with us. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank Thanks, everybody.